Okay, uh, well, can I welcome members and invited guests and those who are with us here today in the chamber and those watching us on webcast. Um, this is the meeting of the education panel and the purpose of this meeting today is to have a conversation um, about um, secondary school exclusions. I use the word conversation in that we're not here to collect evidence because um, so much work has been done on this issue. And I don't think there is any disagreement about the uh, seriousness of the issue or the statistics about the issue. There's issues about variations in terms of um, where there are high levels or low levels. Um, and so that's why we're not looking uh, where we're going with the evidential base that um, has been provided by uh, reputable bodies. And we're then having this conversation on behalf of Londoners who uh, in many ways have raised this uh, either by letter or through conversation with us in terms of uh, their concerns about the uh, levels of exclusion within our secondary education systems. Um, we're going to uh, ask members of the public if they would like to follow us on Twitter then follow us at London Assembly. And if they want to take part in the discussion, then um, do uh, let us have your comments um, using hashtag assembly uh, edu, edu. Um, before I introduce our guests uh, for, for our conversation this afternoon, uh, I, there's a, a short um, number of short items of formal business that we have to go through. Um, so can I just start by asking if there are any, poly well, we're full house, so there's no apologies. Um, and then um, let me just um, uh, say, uh, make an announcement uh, for the record. And that is the educational panel um, had a successful launch of the SEND report following on from our meetings uh, in September and November of last year. Um, we published our report at a bus station and we were with um, the carers and users and uh, members of the press. And um, what that report uh, does is make a series of recommendations to the mayor. Um, and just to flag up uh, a couple of them, um, that was um, uh, the appointment of a SEND champion. Uh, Carers and parents have, uh, they, they brought that recommendation to us and are very supportive of, of that. Um, and that person, if you like, to promote the views of children and young people with SEND um, in terms of how they can have an impact into mayoral strategies so that their lives, their, their aspirations can be embedded in the transport strategy, in the skills strategy, throughout the work of the GLA. Um, the, um, the report had uh, excellent media pickup, um, and um, we're, we're pleased about that, um, both locally across London and um, in um, some uh, trade publications. Um, so, uh, thanks to members and everyone who uh, got involved with that report. Um, the education panel members visited Morley College in May, um, an institution for adult learning, um, and this was following um, uh, a meeting with the principal of Morley College and the work that we were doing on FE colleges. Um, members uh, enjoyed hearing about how the college are supporting its adult learners, particularly those with special education needs and those studying English for speakers of other languages. Um, it, was, it was a great opportunity to sit and uh, sit beside students and hear about their experience. And in fact, we came away with some casework, uh, which I've sent on to Transport for London. And it was the, the issue that most students raise, and that is the cost of transport um, travel in, in the city. Um, so, uh, item two, declaration of interest. Um, can we note the declarations of interest? And does any member have any other declarations to make? None. 
Thank you. Um, now, items three and four, I'll take these together. Can we note the membership, chairing arrangement, and terms of reference as set out on the agenda? Noted. And then, um, minutes. we've got the minutes. So, uh, can members agree the minutes of the last meeting, which was held um, earlier this year uh, in February? Agreed. Agreed. Um, and then the sixth, the list of actions. Can we please note the list um, of completed and outstanding actions? Noted. Three. And then uh, can we note the actions taken under delegated authority? Thank you. And then we come to item eight, which is our conversation today and uh, our discussion on secondary school exclusion. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to um, invite our guests here today. We've got Sean Brown, Head of Curriculum Research uh, from an organisation that we met before in, when they gave evidence to the Police and Crime Committee. Um, it's called The Difference, and The Difference is a charity working to improve outcomes for excluded pupils and to re reduce exclusions from school. So, uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Sean. Uh, Serena Totti, thank you for coming uh, and joining us this afternoon. Deputy teacher of Townley Grammar School in South East London. And it's always nice when we can um, make a link with a former pupil with their, mm -hmm. with their uh, deputy head, as we have earlier, a member of our staff graduated from your school, which is, uh, it must be good to know. It certainly <laughs> is, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have um, a highly regarded and much respected councillor, um, Antoinette Bramble, Deputy Mayor and Cabinet Member for Children's Social Care Education and Young People, London Borough of Hackney. And um, also we'd like to welcome Seamus Oates, CBE Chief Executive Officer of TPBAP. TPAP. TPAP. A multi-agency trust. So that's TBAP Matt. Multi Academy Trust. All right. <laughs> and you run 11 alternative provision and special academies, and we'll look forward to hearing about the work that you're doing. Uh, okay, I, um, can I just um, now turn to um, Deputy Mayor uh, and Councillor Antoinette, Antoinette Bramble? Um, it's fair to say, Hackney when we look at statistics about this area for the last five years in terms of London boroughs has been um, in the sort of top two, three boroughs. And I wonder if uh, you could just talk, talk to us uh, for a couple of minutes and in terms of your remit, I mean, how, what, what did you as a council um, do when this was presented to you and um, just, you know, some key points about the work, because we'll pick up uh, some of these things in the questions to you. Um, thank you. Um, yes, we have been looking um, at exclusions, but I think before I talk about exclusions, I think that part of the challenge, and I'll speak a bit more about that possibly later on, is that if you look at exclusions um, through a lens and only look at exclusions, then that in itself is not helpful as such. I think you need to look at a wider parameter. But if we're looking at exclusion, it is something that we, we have been looking at. You know, Hackney has been successful. I think in 2016, we were first in the country for GCSE progress for Key Stage 1 um, at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 results. Our SEND children were third in the country. Our free school meals were third in the country. Our SEND children were also, I think, fifth in the country for academic academic achievement but we also looked at exclusions and thinking well how do we shift the dial on that also so one of the things that we looked at was a no need to exclude um, policy which is what we are working now with schools and getting the buy-in with schools and within that policy is a range of different techniques that schools can use to think about how they reduce exclusions but also within that parameter is the pedagogy around ethos and culture because actually when you start talking about exclusions it's quite punitive now i suppose i should declare an interest i used to be an assistant head 
and an inclusion manager within a primary school. So I'm not, it's not that I'm soft on behaviour at all, or I don't believe there should be consequences. But actually, if you're dealing with children and you start at a punitive manner, I think that's quite problematic. So what our policy focuses on, on is health and well-being, the well-being of young people and how you move forward on that. And actually, it's a real shift and a culture change. And it's a more disciplined way of working. And I often use the example as a school teacher, there was always one child that you'd have to refrain from putting your hand on your hip and saying to that child, how dare you? And actually, there are many moments in that. And if you are a parent or a godparent or an aunt or uncle, whatever way in your life that you engage with children, there's going to be a moment with a child. But actually, it's how do you interface with that child? And actually, it's a way of working differently. Because there are children that sometimes just don't behave. But as adults, we could argue there are some adults that often don't behave. But actually, how do we better distinguish between a child that isn't behaving for one reason or another, but a child who is trying to indicate, actually, there's something quite wrong, mm -hmm. and part of me indicating something's quite wrong, you're misinterpreting me not being able to manage my behaviour as just me misbehaving. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's been enough dialogue around that as well. So hopefully we'll get to unpick that. But on that note, possibly, Chair, you, I might pause there because I can feel myself continuing to talk quite a bit on this. <laughs> no, I think is, is, you, that, is that enough? You'll is be, that enough? You, thank you for that, and that's a really uh, nice introduction. Um, and so what we then would like you to do is take us through what happens to a young person once they have been permanently excluded. So if we can just focus on, uh, we know that the number of temporary exclusions is a huge number, but we also know that there's less than a thousand young people across London, uh, that was in 2016-17, who had been permanently excluded. So um, how do young people and their parents and carers get involved in the dec decision making from, from what's, what you're doing in, in Hackney? So are you talking about the broader piece of work we're doing around strategies or are you talking about an individual case? Well, uh, an individual case might, uh, might help us uh, to understand the, the progress. Well, I, th I suppose one of the things that I would say is that um, what we do is we have, a, we have a guide for parents and carers to walk them through that process. Mm -hmm. Because what you've, got to, what you've got to remember is that at the point of exclusion, often relationships are broken down between the adult, um, the child and the school. Mm -hmm. um, it can be quite a, a tense um, situation, but also for parents quite worrying. And depending on the level of confidence um, of the parents and the ability to navigate all of the different things that are happening in school, it can also be quite stressful. So we set out a guide, and the guide, I'll talk you through it, it gives you an overview of what happens and when your child is excluded. It also talks about, it also talks you through um, what happens if there's a fixed term exclusion and a permanent exclusion. It breaks down the exclusions, whether it's less than five days, more than six days, or if it's permanent. So all the way through the process, the parent has got that guide, because all of that information is quite important. The guide also then goes on to talk to you about what to expect from the head, um, the governors, what you can then do as a parent through that process. It also talks about what provision will be made for that child in each of those different scenarios, um, which is quite helpful. It also gives you lots of what happens next, because it's all very well that you're in this situation now, but actually, what should I be expecting? And if that doesn't happen, who do I then ask? So all of that's in there as well. It also talks you through if it's a fixed term or permanent in the same manner again. The expectation on the school, the expectation on you as a parent and carer, what provisions were made for your child. In the booklet as well, what we've also got is places where parents can get help from. And I have to say parents and carers, because we have to remember that not every child is living at home with their parents. So there are places like Corrins Field, for example, and law centres where parents can get advocates. And what we do always encourage parents to do, even if they phone our services, is to actually get an advocate, someone that can turn up at that meeting with you. Um, in Hackney, unfortunately, we still offer a young people service, and I'm in uh, Young Hackney sits within my political portfolio, and actually we have officers that will go to those meetings. Um, with young people as well, because we have something called the re-engagement unit that, I'm, that I'll speak about maybe possibly a bit later, but members of staff that are in that re-engagement unit 
the work that they do, I'll mention it now, is that they work with schools and around children that are on the outskirts of possibly being excluded. So it's how you pr pr stop that child from being excluded and what provisions we can put in place. Or if there's an exclusion around about to happen, how that young person can have an advocate. And then that person from the re-engagement unit will then go to those, some of those key meetings with those parents if they so choose. So they don't feel like they're, they're, they're dealing with it alone. Thanks, that's lovely. Um, Seamus, uh, um, do you have anything to add in terms of your experience? Um, is this common across um, uh, London and is that a process that you use within your um, okay, so academy structure? Yeah, I mean, within our organisation within London, we work um, in Harringay and Hammersmith and Fulham, Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster. Um, so I can talk very much from that perspective within, within the London context. Um, our organisation runs alternative provision um, academies and um, special academies for learners who've been excluded or who've got social and emotional difficulties. And within the London context, we run alternative provision academies, um, all of which used to be pupil referral units. So they have replaced the pupil referral units that were in those particular boroughs that I've talked about. In addition, we, um, we uh, manage a number of earlier intervention um, uh, strategies, and I think one, of, one, one in particular that really chimes uh, with the re-engagement unit is the uh, concept of what we call a managed intervention centre. So we have one of those in each of the um, three, the four boroughs in London that we work with, and that's very much aimed at targeting um, young people who are on the edges of exclusion, so schools can refer them to those centres and the schools within our authorities buy places um, at those centres and there's a very specific curriculum that's delivered and the curriculum that is, is, ar is around ensuring they can keep up with school, the mainstream school, but more importantly working on some of the issues they, that they may have come across uh, within the school context that they, they've been at. It's for a very short defined period of time, a maximum of 45 days um, that, 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 in, that that takes place. And similarly we ensure that the staff from uh, those centres are involved in any meetings that are taking place with the school um, and with other agencies and that's something I'd quite like to touch on in a moment because I think sometimes those multi-agency meetings could be a lot better and a lot more effective in terms of preventing exclusion. We found that those centres, having that option for schools to dip into before they get to a permanent exclusion is really effective um, and, and it's shown whilst the rates of exclusion have increased as they have in every London borough, what's been great for us is that the learners who've come to those centres have not come back. So they've gone back into mainstream and not come back into the system of exclusion. Um, so I think early intervention was really important in that context. Within some of our boroughs, we also have um, primary intervention teams that go in to primary schools and work uh, alongside learners uh, and staff and um, learners in those schools. But again, all of this provision is increasingly difficult to deliver given the uh, cost um, constraints around it and the fact that schools have to find money to pay for this kind of provision um, from, from rapidly sort of decreasing budget. So um, we are under pressure on that level. However, the success rates of early intervention centres have been really clear for us to see. Um, I can talk more about learners who are permanently excluded as well because those are the ones who then come to our alternative provision academies and that's a slightly different story yeah. and different journey. Okay, we'll c I'm sure we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, uh, Sean, uh, from what you've heard so far, anything to add in terms of uh, <coughs> supportive or challenge? Um, not particularly challenge, um, but I would like to, I suppose it's worth picking up on the fact that we're talking, we, one of the things we're talking about is permanent exclusions and we've, we've seen that permanent exclusions have risen after a period um, of quite a number of years of them falling from 2006 to 2013. Um, and to ask the question, what, think about the question, um, why, you know, why has that process started and been so consistent, not just in London, but, but nationally, it's a fairly consistent trend. Um, and at the same time as thinking about that, also bear in mind that the, the, the positive, although it's just, there aren't often that many positives that you can take from the process of a permanent exclusion, but one of the positives is that the way that it is conducted 
um, is is a very it's a very transparent process. It's a very trackable process, and so it's a process that we can see when um, young people are being permanently excluded. We can see who they are. We can find out all sorts of things about them, and also to look at their outcomes wherever they go um, afterwards. Um, and whilst there is a, it is disappointing and, and, and definitely worth us pursuing the look at the why. I think it's important to bear that in mind that it's, there are good things about the fact we can track it. When we bear it, when we consider that permanent exclusions are only a very, very small fraction of the number of students every year mm. who will move school because the school that they're in has decided that there isn't really, a, there, it's untenable to retain their place in the school. And every local authority has a, a fair access panel that will work in often in quite different ways, brokering the movements of students from one school and into another. And those managed moves, which is what they're called, are, are very difficult to track and to trace their they, they, and, and as a consequence, it's very difficult to know who it's happening to, mm -hmm. how many times it's happening, um, what are the rates, and you know, are we seeing the same trend in managed moves and permanent exclusions, or actually, what are we are we seeing a shift from managed moves towards permanent exclusions? Mm -hmm. So that it, it, it's worrying in to, to not be able to dig into that information, and I suppose on top of that as well, we have no idea. I might, might mention this later when we're thinking about attainment. But we have no idea about the outcomes for managed move students because once they've managed moves, they're no, they're no longer part of a system. They're, they're on the roll of the school, and we can't very easily can make comparisons between um, those students. Yeah. And I would just like, sorry, very quickly to reiterate what um, Seamus had said. When we, one of the primary reasons behind the rise of permanent exclusions over the last five years is that schools are facing increasing pressures to whichever language you might choose, divert, direct, resources that might have been available for inclusion towards basic um, meeting of, of, of progress and achievement, you know, aims and objectives of their school. And, in, and one of the key things that, within that is their ability to um, look for alternative edge of exclusion provision that, that might actually support a young person to stay at their sending school rather than have to make a move. And if you can't afford within your budgets to pay for, for that, what tends to happen is you hold on to a young person as long as you can mm -hmm. to the point that it reaches a crisis. And at that mm -hmm. point, the process, you know, your, your, your choices are, are quite limited as a school. Yeah, my colleague wants to come in on, and pick up a number of the issues you've um, raised. I'm quite interested um, and concerned about managed moves and sort of the rights of children in relation to them, particularly as you sort of highlight some of the sort of um, lack of transparency about it. Um, uh, Antoinette Bramble has shown us a document that's about sort of if your child has been excluded. Have you come across any examples where any council or any school chain would have a similar document related to your child is at risk of having it? Is, is there anything documented is anything written down about a child's right in relation to managed moves um every local authority will have a set of rules based around normally based around their fair access panel but actually it is still entirely legal for schools to broker managed moves between each other so, so in but so which would so what moves that go through local authority would still be transparent in some way and would have mm -hmm. and it's possible that you could have a set of you know agreed guidance that a parent might have but it's also entirely legal for one school in a local authority to make a decision about the managed move and and so the idea that that you could you couldn't you know they would there wouldn't be a document that every single school is preparing so i'd say that they, there are guidance and i'm sure it actually probably sits in the same guidance yeah. that antoinette was talking about in hackney um, that there's an element of the managed move process within there for Hackney students going through their fair access panel, but it's not um, it's 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 not not widely considered as a, as a key bit of information that parents are going to get. It's a discussion, but it's primarily a discussion between a parent and a student who's on the edge of exclusion yeah. about what is the best option for them, and the best option being a chance to make a fresh start in a new school rather than 
to continue down a road where there's been lots of external exclusions and where that might lead to a permanent exclusion in the future. And parents and a, and a student making a decision, you know, a, quite a reasonable decision, that yeah. actually um, they, they themselves would like a chance to go and try and make a fresh start in a new school. And although there are lots of positives in that, the process of transition yeah. Um, is a process in which a huge amount is lost <coughs> about what has been done, what could be done, what might be done, and that fresh start often is a beginning again for all of those processes that might have supported a young person. So would there be any statistics on how many um, children, young people who get permanently excluded have already had to manage moves before they get to that point? No, you would. No, it wouldn't nothing. because no, no, it wouldn't because because manage move on a, on a, from something like the Edu database. There's no. There's no way of drawing that information out because managed move is not something which is attached to uh, pupils. So we don't have any UDI. of the demo we don't have any of the demographic data that we would in relation to exclusions because um, obviously exclusion. there's quite a lot and, of data. And, and, and yeah. for, Tim, from my point of view, from you know as a, as a, a practitioner, although the reasons that permanent exclusions went down was mm. there was a period of time when it, when when schools were very conscious of it and local authorities were very conscious of permanent exclusions and and they looked for ways. Um, to, to, to reduce those figures mm -hmm. and one of the ways that those figures have reduced is manage moves and enable somebody to move without there being a permanent exclusion. Mm -hmm. Actually, it would be better if everybody moving schools was permanently excluded in part for some reasons because at least we would know who they all were. We would be able to find out where they went and what happened to them afterwards, which we can't do. Okay. Or you could just track it and not call it permanent exclusion. I mean, if, if, you, if you introduce a new statistic on that, then that would avoid them being labelled as being permanently excluded, which, it, I mean, I think we'll come on to at various points in discussion, is clearly something that hangs over people for a long time. So, yeah. But those stats might be quite something that we might pick up on. Yes, and... and yeah. to, to I just come in on that point. I, I, I would say I strongly disagree with just saying it's better to permanently exclude exclude children for the data and I'm sure you didn't mean it in that no, way. I, did, I didn't mean I, I meant so that they we, didn't we, we know the outcomes yeah. for children that are permanently excluded. The data tells us a very negative and challenging story of where those children often end up. So actually that's not the solution. I think Gony you're right to raise the question. Is there a concern about it? When I'm talking to colleagues not this is not just a, a London issue, it's regional and when I speak to colleagues from other regions as well there is a concern about managed move. So man a managed move in itself is not an issue. It's yeah. a good strategy yeah. for a parent and a child if that's the best thing to do. I think you're right to raise the question because the concern is if that's a way that school used to off-roll children mm -hmm. and no one can be held account. And I think if I can preempt what you're getting to is that you're raising and beginning to raise a question of the challenge here. Because actually, going back to your point, that when you've got permanent exclusions, that's quite easy to have the data. The challenge is, is the internal exclusions within schools and the management is where you can't really track children and how they're being moved around and how they're managed, and that's the challenge. And could I just, could I just I, you're right, I didn't mean it as, and it would be great to see lots more children permanently excluded, but one of the things that the permanent exclusion process does provide is, is quite a clear set of rights and and, and process, due process for parents to challenge what's going on in a way that, that, that something which is less transparent doesn't give them that, that kind of... Yeah. Um, so, those so can we just confirm then, uh, you're saying that at the moment the child who's uh, in parent care is involved in the child move, there are no statute, they, they have no statutory hooks or no because it's a voluntary process that they they agree to enter into so it's not something that is forced upon them um, it would be something that they accept and decide is a good idea so so there's an agreement between parties yes but you're you're saying if that was an imbalance then the parent and child in that sort of relationship doesn't have um, if you like, rights of appeal yeah, there's, or there's any structures that yeah. is there to protect them. Yeah. Right. Which, which, that's worrying, isn't it? It's worrying. Managed moves can, can be really successful and when they're done well, and I've seen them done well in a number of authorities, uh, they involve the consent and an informed consent and agreement of the parent, the child and both the schools, if it's a managed move between the schools. And that can work really well to give someone a fresh start as an alternative to exclusion. Where it doesn't work is when, and I've seen this happen over the years, is where a parent is presented with a choice. 
either take a managed move or your child will be excluded. Oh. That's that you know that then is you know you're, you're removing any sense of, of, of rights or entitlement mm. from from that family. Um, with a permanent exclusion, parents have a right to appeal. There's due process that they can go through. A managed move, as it's a voluntary agreement, there is there are no rights attached to that. Where a managed move takes place from school to school, um, we can rest assured that the uh, outcomes from that learner are still being tracked because the school that they move to is accountable to Ofsted um, and they remain on the role of a school. What is very concerning is where children are effectively off-rolled from mainstream schools into um, perhaps independent or unofficial or unregistered alternative provision um, where, which may not be held to account. And there, I think the difference of quoted figures nationally of 40,000 unofficial permanent exclusions and uh, unofficial exclusions taking place um, which will be replicated in the London scenario so there are concerns around that in terms of how a child's um, outcomes are tracked afterwards um, there, we are talking through the alternative provision uh, review about the concept of um, schools whenever they do a managed move or permanently excluded child remaining accountable to some extent for the outcomes of that child throughout their educational history which sounds like a very neat solution, but becomes very challenging when you talk about a child who may have gone to three or four schools, which school holds, holds the responsibility. So it is a complex scenario without an easy solution, but there, there are, I think, cases certainly within London where children's rights are not upheld and they, don't, and they are being coerced into a managed move that may not be the best thing for them. But we must still hold on to the fact that a, a well-managed managed move mm -hmm. can make, be, make a real difference to a young person, as can sometimes a managed move into alternative provision. Okay. Serena, uh, just following think, on from I, what you've I would heard. really agree with that. I mean, we're very lucky as a school where I am that we don't come across this very often, but I think managed moves can be very, very positive if they are done properly. I think the flaw here is that there isn't really a simple strategy process for every school when you exclude, you have, a, you have to follow a guideline and you have to follow it. Maybe with managed moves, that's something that has to be considered within that so that then every school does the same thing so that you can avoid when a student, a pupil is kind of forced into a scenario of this or that, or that it's actually the best option for them. And we've taken a managed move before and it is highly successful but it's the, I think it's the process that it just depends on each school and how they do it that, that, that happens. And that's where you lose the information, you lose the data, and anything can happen within that. Whereas if it's an actual system, similar to exclusions, then you can actually make sure it's done the correct way. My concern, was, excuse me, with um, yes, Chair, please. would be that um, it feels like in some cases a voluntary managed move isn't entirely voluntary because if you've got a bigger threat hanging over yeah. you then that stops being voluntary and, that's and it where starts being a bit coercive and what, yeah. so and I think that that's where the lack of transparency in terms of statistics come mm. in because if nobody's having to report on data or demographics or mm. what happens to those children when they do get moved then it's very difficult for anybody to sort of uh, identify and challenge and rectify any sort of flaws in, in that system. Yeah. Well, when we did a, a, a previous piece of work, we came across this whole issue of churn, where schools were saying, you know, huge churn, uh, pupils are moving in and out, in and out. I mean, how would we know um, how many managed moves um, a child experiences? Experiences. Mm -hmm. um, it, because, because there isn't a requirement within a school, a school record to, to, to make a mark like you would do. So within any student's record in a, in a mainstream or any school, um, if they were looked after, there's a, there's a mark that, that you, have to, mm. you have to click, a box you have to tick, and that me makes all of the, the, the data that is collected on them in that school, it can be sourced and extracted by the DfE into its own database, and, and that feature can be, um, can be you know, you can, you can an analyze it based on that piece of data. Mm. That isn't there. Isn't a piece of data mm. that is indicated for somebody who's who's come into a school from a managed managed move. Even yeah. though the school will keep a record of that information, it's not that they wouldn't know that happened. But once you once they've reached year eleven and they've left, and 
that's not, it's not possible to know whether they were, had one or two or three or anything. At the minute, that's not something that, that, that we could ever find out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I just go back to Seamus and say, data seems to indicate that uh, special academies and free schools have a higher rate of exclusions than local authority maintained special schools. Why might this be the case? Special academies have a higher rate. Yes, yeah, special exclusion. and free schools. I think it's quite unusual for special schools to exclude. Mm. at all so I, you know, I'd have to see the data behind that mm. um, James they're talking about it's, it's referencing fixed term exclusion rates rather than uh, permanent exclusion yeah. rates sorry Seamus yeah, sure, sorry Sean we didn't hear what you said it was, it, so the data about the special and academy schools having higher rates of exclusion I think is specifically around fixed term exclusions mm -hmm. so exclusions from within the school mm -hmm. but not being not permanent exclusions I, I can't really comment on that nationally or, or within the London context within my own context we don't have any permanent exclusions from any of our schools um, mm -hmm. we will we have very low rates of fixed term exclusion as well within our schools because we have alternatives to fixed term exclusion which we use as a strategy um, so in terms of tackling that issue I would say um, there, there we've got so, certainly lots of strategies that we would make available to other free schools and specials that if they, if they choose to use it um, I, I don't see a particular well, look I, we, we work with within the London context most of our mainstream schools are now academised actually so but over the years we haven't seen a particularly big difference between academies and maintained school locally maintained schools in terms of exclusion in fact quite a lot of our locally maintained schools had higher rates of exclusion because they they it often correlates with performance thank you and then um and in fact, going back to the, the situation in Hackney, which I said earlier, if you look at the data with the highest rates of exclusions, um, did you come out with any reasoning behind um, that relatively high exclusion rate? I don't know. I, I mean, there was no, there's no simple answer, and I can speak about Hackney. I go back to saying, and not that I'm trying to excuse our high exclusion rates at all, that's why I'm here. But actually, this is a national and London issue. It, it's pan-London. And we have to think about the interface between mainstream schools and academies. I'm not saying that academies are different. But I think nationally, when you look at how local authorities have a relationship with their maintained schools and you don't have that same relationship with academies, does that... Does that make a difference? In Hackney, fortunately, we've built, we built all of our academies from scratch, so we have a coastal relationships. I think you have to look at, is it, the re, is it the regime? Is it lack of consistency in behavior? We talked about finances. There's a lot of money coming out of the school. You've got very, we, I said that we were the top performing country uh, schools in the country um, with a very rich and balanced curricula. Um, with money coming out of the system, you have to think, well, what gives? And what you find out, um, in, in terms of local authorities, the first thing that goes is prevention and early preventative work. And you have to kind of think, well, in a school environment, when money's coming out of the system, all of those extra staff that were doing all those extra work, are they the people that have moved out of the system? So, for example, um, Hackney is one of the local authorities that was biggest hit by the national funding formula. So, so the data is telling us something, you know, exclusions have gone up and finance has gone down. So we can't say, is it just about money? But no, but is money making a difference and does play a part in it? I would have to say yes, because actually the support workers that would have been working with those children are not there now. The members of staff that are not class-based that would have done those assessments are not there in the same way now. And when head teachers are making the decision when a member of staff leaves, they're thinking, am I going to employ that post? Or, um, you know, I know that you're employed to do geography, but actually I need you now to teach history. These are very real situations, and this is not just about Hackney now. I am going to put on that a broader London approach. These are situations that London schools are going across the piece. Um, I also think what hasn't been mentioned now is a, is a bit as a disproportionality within exclusions as well. And I think in response to your questions, and I'm not quite sure that I answered it broadly, when we realised we got a high exclusion rate, what we did is introduce our no need to exclude policy. And I'll talk to you through a bit, of, a, bit, a bit about it. And as I said to you before, that we tried to take it back and focus on well-being and look at pedagogy, what works well 
and how do young people flourish and thrive. We also focus in the strategy as well, the well-being of staff. So it's not just about the young people, mm -hmm. yes it's about you, but actually if you don't focus on the adults that look after people, it, it doesn't become all about you. So what does, that, what does that look like for the staff team? What are the levels of stress? So we talk about the definition of well-being. We look at the framework where we adopt the whole school approach. As a school, what does your health and well-being, what does it look like? How do you promote it? How does it interface? We set out quite clearly referral pathways. So at every stage of that child's life, if there are any issues or concerns of well-being for the child, the children oh, and, and the wider family, where can you signpost into the local authority before it gets critical? Because exclusion is quite punitive and it's quite critical. Don't get me wrong, there are some extreme cases where it's not in the best interest for a child to stay within a school. I get that. But actually, that's only in a small minority of cases. However, quite a lot of children are being affected by this. So what does that look like? It's how we work better with the alternative provision, but there's a dialogue to have around that. So one of the things that we're doing is our alternative providers, how they work better with our maintained and, and academies actually. What does that interface look like and how does that bridge in and bridge out back into mainstream look like? Whole school systems approach. Um, I remember that when I was head of exclusions, the, the head was concerned that so many children were getting sent to his office. And I did a piece of work with children and staff. And uh, the short answer is that actually, when we looked at our approach around behaviour and when we were all consistent, the amount of children that went to the head's teacher reduced. Now, to get to that point, there was a lot of systematic work we had to put in place. But actually, the key was consistency around behaviour. And I can't emphasise that enough. So it's, are we looking as a school community um, at our school behaviour and what does that look like and the level of consistency? And how are we building our teachers as well to feel confident in that class? Because if you're a confident teacher, actually your classroom management um, is a different place than if you are quite apprehensive and, and nervous. So, but I'm not saying that we have exclusion because you have nervous teachers, I'm not saying that. But actually, it's when you're looking at this, you need to take a systems approach. I think we do a big piece around SEAL, so the emotional development in schools, so that children are getting that and in terms of the lesson plans. And we have members of staff from Young Hackney that go into schools and team teach with teachers, work alongside teachers to speak to children about um, health and well-being. Restorative justice is something that's really going well in some of our primary schools. Um, I went to visit Queensbridge Primary School the other day and it's a fantastic approach. Does it take a lot more energy? Absolutely. And initially to get it going, it can qu feel quite exhaustive. But actually when you put that progress in place, it really works. So I'll give you a short example. What restorative justice does, it means if there's an incident where you have an incident with the child, often at the end of that lesson, there isn't time for you to always deal and discuss that with the child. But what restorative justice does is that at the end of that school day, that child and that um, teacher get a chance to speak. Now, any of you that have been involved with young people, they have a huge sense of justice, and my goodness, do they have a huge sense of injustice. And actually, often that child just wants to have that say. And at the end of the day, the child and the member of staff come together, and the member of staff will talk about well, why they didn't quite like that behaviour. And the young persons get their say, and then you get to reset. And often that doesn't happen because the, the mechanics of a school day and actually the pressure on schools in terms of what they have to cover in the commitment, in the curriculum, doesn't allow for that. So it's at the end of the school day and we're finding that works so, so well to reset those relationships with children and young people. We've also talked about um, our anti-bullying policy and what that looks like and trying to in, inherit a new, a new sense of mindfulness around um, behaviour, how we model behaviour, how we identify behaviour, and also better, and, and just ensuring as a local authority that we're providing the support and networks that, that children and staff need. Um, we've got pastoral support plans that are in place to support children that are at risk of exclusion and 
on a pathway to exclusion and how we can manage that, see if we can restore that place within the child. And our re-engagement unit is a more school approach. So as a whole school, you're looking at, do we think there are children that are at risk of exclusion? Is there anything we can do as a school to? So that's our response to those high exclusions, That because we don't want to just be high performing academically, but we do have a broad and rich curriculum. We also want to be good at how we um, help support our, our children that have um, challenging behaviour. Thank you so much for that. That's uh, uh, absolutely excellent. Uh, Serena, uh, anything to add? Yeah, I think it kind of what, what's been said there is really follows on. So one of the key things for us at, at Townley, the core value that we hold is character education. So ensuring that our students, we, we educate them about character. And what comes under that is um, the idea of self-regulation. And actually, if you can build a, student, a, a student's character, then they can learn how to behave, respond. It's not always going to happen, but it's the, it's the foundation of building everything else. And that's one of our core and, and key kind of values within the school. I think what, one of the things you said as well was about listening to a student and, and at the end of the school day, sitting down and, and talking to them. That's our approach. It's, it's not a zero tolerance, scream at a student, tell them that they've done wrong and move on. It's sit down and let them have a say and have a discussion to build that character, get them to feel that they're being listened to, get them to learn how they can self-regulate themselves to move forward. But some of the really key issues I think that we have is training and are um, people coming into teaching being trained fully in behaviour and have they, have they got enough experience or um, role models to be able to understand um, and respond to behaviour because I think it is something that needs a lot more focus because a lot of people can react in the wrong way and that's where things escalate that can lead to exclusions that never needed to happen in the first place mm -hmm. so it's i think there's a lot around training um for for people coming into education as teachers that is really really important um, i think um money for schools is is a really big problem when a student is excluded if it's just a short fixed term exclusion if that happens or if you want to try alternative routes before that it comes comes to that do the schools actually have the resources to be able to do that so many schools now are, have not got the funding for it but how do they put that in place how do they ensure they have a student services a support system for those students to ensure they never get to that stage and i think that's a really really big problem for a lot of schools that they don't have the funding and the staffing to be able to give students enough provision when these things happen um, Another one as well, and I think this is where we talk about the self-regulation um, and the character building. It, it seems like a small one for, for a school, but for us, social media can be a big problem where, where we lead to exclusions. Um, and a lot of schools have taken approach of banning mobile phones. We haven't banned mobile phones in our school. We've had a detox. So what that is teaching our students is self-regulating how they use their phone. Don't tell them you can't use it because the first thing they want to do is use it. It's actually teaching them to regulate how they use their phone. So no banning, it's here's a detox, this is how it works. And that's really important because social media, I think, can come into a lot of on why there are high exclusion rates across schools. That's one of the big underlying problems. Lovely. Let's, um, I want to move on and hand over to my colleague now in terms of let's get the concept uh, a bit more about complex needs and um, how that fits in. Yeah, this uh, is a question now. to everyone on the panel really um, and it's been alluded to in Serena your, your comments about um, some of the children being excluded and obviously many children who are excluded have multiple support needs um, including mental health issues, special education needs and unstable home situations. Um, how can secondary schools be supported better to provide an environment that meets their needs? Can I just Shame pick up on like that? I think we, we, we know obviously into our alternative provision academies come the learners that have failed in mainstream, where mainstream schools haven't been able to provide the environment that is needed to stop them being excluded. And I always, always say to staff at the beginning of the year, you know, we, we have children who 
would have come through some of the, some of the best schools, so schools that you've described in Hackney, where you have every intervention in place or the mm -hmm. desire to put everything in. Mm -hmm. um, also from schools where there is a zero tolerance and nothing's, you know, they, they wear their unit tie askew three times and they're excluded. So they'd have come from both extremes of, of the educational spectrum. Um, and what we have to do is to do something different and do something that's going to really drill into their needs and their requirements. And yes, when we do that, we, we never find that the fault lies with the child. I can always trace back and they will, they will have been let down at some point by the system, by an adult in their lives, or they will have developed, almost all of them, some kind of mental health need um, as, as they've come through the system. So the challenge we have then is how do we support them to get through those issues? And we have to be very, very specific and very um, holistic in, 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 the, in the provision that we put around each learner. Um, and we talk all the time about a personalised approach to it. And within a mainstream context, that's very difficult to achieve because you are, you know, you have classes of 30, you have six lessons a day, you have time scales, time constraints, limits around you. But it, where it works well, schools manage to make the time for those particular groups. And I just glanced at one of your documents there and, and I saw nurture groups, circle time, yeah. you know, a, a responsible adult for them to come to. These are all the kinds of things that actually don't cost too much money if you, if you go in there with that approach. Um, and recognise that no child wants to be excluded, no child wants to be causing problems, no child wants to be the naughty one. Yeah. It's, that behaviour is always actually a cover or a, or a, a cry for help. And you know, we, we get some of the most extreme learners coming in, so therefore we experience some of the most extreme behaviours. Um, when I experience the most extreme behaviours, and I mean very extreme within some of our schools, when we trace back, we can always find a very small trigger point which actually, if the staff member had done something slightly different, then the behaviour wouldn't have escalated. So when we talk about teacher training, it's really important that they don't just have 15 minutes on a Friday afternoon on behaviour management. They actually get to have training on some of the issues that these learners come with in terms of their attachment needs, in terms of their traumas that they've been through, in terms of strategies that staff can use to support them. And we've been working with the difference, actually, talking about getting leaders into alternative provision and proofs from mainstream so that they have to have some experience of actually seeing these children that will go into the mainstream schools and be really difficult to deal with, suddenly seeing them be successful and happy in a different learning environment will change the perception of the leaders in those schools and the teachers that work with them. So I think teacher training is really important and, and ways in which we can facilitate exchange of staff from mainstream into alternative provision into special educational needs settings is a good thing because at the moment it's still a kind of optional bit of your teacher training if you want to go and sit in a pre or a special school for a few weeks actually it should be a mandatory significant part of your teacher training i think so do most teacher ideas. training courses then not include um much on behavior they vary yeah. i mean i i just going 10 years but I think I had a, a two-hour lecture mm. on behaviour and then obviously I had my six, two, three or six-week placements where you then have to obviously practice it but if you get put into you know a top performing grammar school you're not going to come across many behaviour they're going to be minor con compared to other schools so you know if someone could go through a teach training year with very very little real experience of behaviour management it, there isn't, you know, uh, maybe now with te there's more of it, but it, it's not huge amounts. Mm. There's more, but it's not a massive amount, is it? I mean, we do, we do within our schools, we deliver, we have, we place, have placements, and we also train staff up to work in it. But there could be a lot more, and I think yeah, that's something definitely. we're keen to do. And um, I, I was just going to pick up on that, um, the, the the complex needs and uh, and also over representation of groups within a whole range of exclusion type statistics and suggest that when we see over representation of looked after children or children on child protection plans or children with mental health needs or SEN, we, I think we have to be, be ready to look inside that and think that that's not all children with mental health problems who are being excluded. It's not all children with SEN who are being excluded. And, and, and what, what we're actually um, seeing is kind of comorbidity. We're seeing within those children um, mental health need and 
um, some form of learning need and possibly an experience of trauma in their early childhood. Now, now one of those labels potentially is the one that tracks through with them much more obviously when we look at their exclusion data. And so we see spikes of SEN students, we see spikes of, of students with mental health needs. But what, what, is, what is much, much more significant is the... Um, is, is that yeah? It's that comorbidity. It's the fact that young young children, in particular, particularly at primary early years, who've experienced really adverse childhood experiences, a great deal of data about the link between adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. and then uh, roots into not just school exclusion, but also then into gang grooming and a whole range of other harmful adolescent experiences. And it's when those experiences are combined with learning needs or having to move out and, and, and have a different home that you that you start to see really challenging behaviours. And what is particularly difficult in a mainstream school is that as those behaviours might start to escalate and be recognised and a mainstream school might start to respond to, to that, that, that young person and put support in place, often the um, the, the, the speed with which that escalates to a, to a crisis point for a young person who has that complexity of need because it's coming from a whole range of different areas of their life, um, it, it's, it's much, much quicker than, than any, for, any way that a school can access statutory external support in a way that would actually keep that young person in a mainstream school. So you give the, think of an example in terms of an education health care plan you know, there's, a, there's lots of really good reasons why that's a very thorough process and, it's, and, are, and it goes through a whole range of different stages. But the point at which a young person reaches crisis and would potentially qualify for and require that level of support to keep them in a mainstream school, you're a minimum of 20, but probably somewhere in the region of 30 weeks plus. 30 weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. By, by the time you actually have a plan with resources that mm. you could put in place. So even before that plan starts, it would be 30 weeks, and then you'd have to start trying to source things and sign... Different local okay. authorities would get... It would be the different yeah. time, but the 20, 20 weeks is the, is the consultation... Is, is, is the period, is the sort of minimum expected okay. time frame, and yeah. that, that doesn't take you to the point where... The resources with you, and I give that. I mean, you know, you could you could you could take a different angle, and you could take a social care angle, and think about the point yeah. at which you're able to access the resources and support of a child protection plan. And for again, for good reasons, there are thresholds, and they step up. But for a school who with a young child who's who's in crisis, that lag time can be really significant in terms of actually getting coordinated external support that would keep and help to keep a young person in a mainstream so school. Can I, can I bring Serena in? Because you're deputy head at a, at a school, is yep. it Bexley? Yep. Yeah. So um, what would enable you, what would, what would help you in terms of accessing resources sooner, making sure you're supported better, to make sure you can provide an environment and all the resources to sort of meet the needs of a child or young person who could be prevented from facing permanent exclusion, could actually sort of be helped through the process? What, what, what would you need in order to sort of support Faster you? processes. Faster processes. So mm -hmm. when, when support is needed, when we have a student that might be identified with mental health needs, yeah. as minor or major as they are, there are some, because they are so minor, we could wait weeks and months before we can get any external support for them because of the pressures of other agencies out, outside of that which puts the pressure on us as a school, and then alongside that, having the funding to be able to um, provide what support we can yeah. um, while in school. I mean, we're very lucky, and we, we put a lot of money into our student services support, and we have a very good team. We've really focused tight off on therapeutic intervention. We've invested in a therapy dog um, as well, mm. um, and all of that really supports us and our school but it's not enough, yeah. you know, having access and faster access to outside agency support is really needed. Yeah. But that's pressures on other agencies and other departments that, that, yeah. that's there as well. Because the uh, line of questioning I was going to go in terms of mental health was about whether teachers actually recognise the mental health issues. Um, <coughs> do you think there's an issue with teachers struggling to recognise mental health issues? <coughs> or would you think it's more along the lines that um, you... you 
you've experienced, which is it's hard to it's, get those services accessed. I think there's still training comes under that again. Um, mm. I think there's definitely more training that's needed. Mental health over the last you know five to ten years has rapidly increased mm. in, in statistics right, right across all schools. And I think um, staff need more training on that. For us as a school, we have focused on that. We have invested in character education in something mm. called um, IPEN, which is all about positive education and well-being, and that's a focus on students and staff as mm. well. Um, I think by the end of this month, five of our staff will be mental health first aid trained, which is something that's out there now. But all of this is resources, it costs, it, mm. it, you know, it's how, what a school can actually manage and be able to yeah. do. Um, but I think for certain, certainly for some, uh, if all schools, there needs to be a focus on mental health, but it's going to vary um, across each one. Okay. It'll be interesting to see how the mental health green paper rolls out yeah. over the coming year and the impact that that's able to have, the reach that that's able to have into schools, particularly schools where perhaps practice is not necessarily being as good as it, as it could have been to actually reach in and change it. Yeah. Yeah. And also with that, sorry, just to um, the support that's given um, in terms of the age of our students, when they reach 16, 17, 18, it's even harder to access the support that you need. And sometimes that's a, the, crucial, the crucial time. It gets even worse when they get to that age because it's more stretched. Um, they go into adult, the adult sector of it rather than the child sector and it's a real pressure okay and when children when children and young people um with special educational needs but without formal support plans um uh sort of start getting into um difficulty at school in terms of sort of coming towards the point at which they might be facing exclusion are the ways that schools can better support these children young people i think yeah it's <laughs> It's, it's not going down that zero tolerance route, it's, it's thinking about your alternatives. What are the other things that can be done instead of exclusion? There are so many different things a school can do, but it just it will depend on what the school's resources are, what their knowledge, their understanding, what they, they, can, they can see and what staff they have that can support that. But there are, there are so many different routes that you can take to, to support um, students before you get to exclusion, whether they're S you know SEN mental health looked after, whatever mm. it is, you know Saturday detentions, Friday afternoon. There's lots of different things you can do before you get to an exclusion point. Um, but it's exploring that, and it's not being afraid to explore that because yeah. often exclusion is the easy route, isn't it? You can do it, and it's done. You move forward if you if you can, but it's easy to do that. All the other things take time and resources, mm. but actually it, the, the outcome could be much better. I think it's important to recognise as well, sorry, Antoinette, that um, for lots of young people who have that experience and, and struggle in their mainstream school, there are excellent alternative provisions out there. And for them, that process of, ex of, of permanent exclusion or, or managed move or whatever into that alternative provision is actually exactly what they needed in order that they could receive the level of mm. support for their mental health, for their safeguarding yeah. needs, for learning needs that hadn't been identified, and it, you know, yeah. and it, we, 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 it's not, yeah. it, it's not just, it's not quite as black and white as saying um, that the pro, that, that to be excluded is is the end of, of, of everything yeah. and the worst case for, for lots of students. Yeah. But can I can I can I think uh, so I've been shamed in, but then I think I'm trying to sort of move move the question forward a bit. I'm mindful <laughs> that um, uh, we've not got. Only, only uh, the chair and I have had our questioning bits, and I think we've got quite a lot of other people to get through, but Seamus, please come in. Just, I just want to sort of echo that point and make a case for alternative provision, because if you look at the Ofsted outcomes for official yeah. alternative providers, there's a higher proportion that have got outstanding judgments from Ofsted than mainstream secondary schools across the country. So there's some obviously excellent provision out there. It feels to me that we should, not, I guess, in a more sort of theoretically, theoretical way, be talking about upstreaming that provision into mainstream schools so that we can mm. get that support in earlier on if that's something something that can be done that's something that's been a holy grail that has been talked about for 25 years which is why we have to ensure that we still have outstanding 
highly resourced alternative provision available. Training of teachers in, in an awareness of mental health is absolutely crucial. Your, your school is doing a great job there. There are lots of mainstream schools that aren't doing that. We do deliver some mental health training, mm -hmm. and it's, it's almost like a revolu re revolutionary moment or revelatory moment when teachers realise, oh, this is why this person's behaving the way they are, have been behaving for the past couple of months. So it's really important that we can get that training out there to, to teachers. Mental, first, uh, mental health first aiders, really important scheme that's around there. So those mm -hmm. things should be encouraged and shared across the system. Okay, thank you. And then um, just wanted to come on to that. We've talked a little bit about demographics and difference in demographics between um, in terms of exclusions. Um, so if I can start with Antoinette from your perspective from Hackney, um, black children obviously overrepresented sort of nationally across the board in um, exclusions. Um, what is the thinking as to why this might be? And are the programmes such as mentoring that can be shown and demonstrated to help? Okay, so I know that I'm. I'll, I will talk about Hackney a bit, but again, yeah. I think it's. I think it's more helpful to give a London perspective mm -hmm. and a London uh, picture. And I would say that there is a disproportionality of send children, which has been mentioned. And I think that one of the things that we've done with our schools is to say, actually, if you think a child may have an issue with send, or they're going to have an assessment, or there's any assessment in process can you hold off that exclusion? And that's yeah. something that we're working with schools around. Um, I just wanted to go back to saying that broader offer, we have a parenting programme, a counselling mm -hmm. service that we offer our schools, again, as a broader offer. So what's causing the disproportionality? I think we have to talk about unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. I think you cannot get away from that because there's a disproportionality of young black boys being excluded yeah. in the education system. And unless we can confidently sit around this table and say that only black children don't behave or only black parents can't raise children, and I know it sounds quite brutal, but that's what you... Unless we can say that with confidence, we have to be, consider unconscious bias within the system and how we begin to address that. So one of the things that we're doing as a local authority is um, looking at improving outcomes for young black men. So I'm the lead member of a programme of work, and we're looking at not just in education, but the disproportionality across the piece whether it's education, mm. whether it's around health. And what I've got to say, I won't speak too much about the programme now, but what I've got to say to you is that um, will your unconscious bias change if I tell you that if a young black boy has done everything that society has asked him to do, so he's never been to prison, he's never done drugs, he's gone to school, gone to university, and he's still less likely to be unemployed than his white counterparts, you begin to understand that actually unconscious bias does have a, a big part to play because even when young black boys get it right, there's still something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that some black boys don't do things wrong, we know that, but actually we're also working with the media to how we can shift that negative stereotype. Only the minority of young um, men or young black men within our, in, in our communities are doing the wrong thing or caught up in the wrong mm -hmm. thing, but actually if you look at the media, you think it's the majority. The majority of young black men are very successful in doing lots mm -hmm. of positive things. We're talking about the disproportionality here. So actually the media is how we can be better interface with that. I, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's unconscious bias. I think also uh, it's around cultural competency. Mm -hmm. I think that um, people understand, I think about European culture, and, you know, if you're very pro-Europe, you embrace European culture, and we understand that. But actually, when, when Caribbean families came here, they came here at a time that actually uh, the willingness or even the, maybe I would say, the need to understand a cultural uh, background wasn't as interesting or as engaging mm. as, it is, as it is today. I mean, that's my only anecdotal opinion. Yeah. That's not... That's not safe, but I, but I, I begin to, I, I begin to think has that something to it? You know, it was a very different climate and a very hostile climate, and I don't think that in that climate, what a Caribbean culture was and is was really explored in the way that it yeah. was, what it is now. So I think it's, I think it's around cultural, uh, cultural competency and unconscious bias. I think is a lot to. So, but to with the unconscious that. bias, if yeah. we can sort of unpick that a bit, um, then you need to have that address much earlier on than at the point at which a child young person is actually Absolutely. in front of people being excluded. Yeah. How would and you do I also that? say I would also say transition is a big key issue as well because mm. our primary what you if you look at the data, data has shown that 
primary schools often are holding a lot of these young people, but when they go to secondary school, that actually an engaged child is no longer an engaged child. They were doing well in primary school, and even if they are, and, and bright children go on to secondary school and are not doing so well. So it's not just, okay, because they're, they're poor at English and maths, they're not succeeding. So what is that? I think transition points is a lot to do with it as well. Transition is really important. I mean, the, most, the biggest exclusion rates are around the 11, 14 to 16 for us, and that's the kind of year nine transition which is interesting uh, as I, I was left my leadership team just now and I, I told them I was coming here and asked them the question you know what's your biggest what's the biggest issue around exclusion and the answer from one member staff straight away was um, unconscious bias towards black and, uh, and travelers children mm -hmm. so two groups that absolutely. you know they and this is someone who deals with mm -hmm. all of the learners coming in who's been excluded and absolutely sort of picked up upon, upon that mm -hmm. and I asked the question what can we do about it um, and they, their response was, you know, this is again something that has to be included significantly and upfront in teacher training and as a debate and a conversation. Mm. It's something that people are often quite shy away from, actually, in terms of having a really upfront and honest conversation. What does up unconscious bias towards a traveller child look like in real life? Yeah. What does unconscious bias towards an Afro Caribbean boy look like in real life? So those kinds of conversations, you know, and, and, and scenarios need to be played out in, in the classroom, so not in the classroom situations and in schools um, to move us forward from it. Some of the things, you know, I did a lot of work with the youth justice system, so when we look at the young offenders institutions, again, surprise, surprise, much higher disproportionality of black and traveller children in, in, um, in the youth offending system, most of whom have been excluded, most of whom were excluded before they got to the age mm -hmm. of 14. So, you know, this is, this is the, and there's not many of them across the country or in London, up to a thousand across the country. Um, but, the, you know, these are the product of things going wrong. So we need to really look at what can change that. Mentoring programs are quite are good when we have successful role models coming in and not successful role models who've lived the lives that they've led and then changed yeah. their mind, but successful role models who have been successful. Um, I think it's really important to have that. And just to pick up on, because part of your question was, is it about mentors? I think that's one part of the puzzle, but it's also about it's also about the curriculum. It's also about resources. You know, when you have books, who are the images in the books? You know, when you are talking about lessons, you know, black history is about the past, but actually if, if the only time black children are hearing about black people are the ones that are dead, subliminally are you sending a message about the success of the future? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not saying that don't talk about people that are in the past, history is history, but actually what are you doing in the nuance yeah. of today? Um, <laughs> just, just, I'd written this down before we came to today to, to sort of talk about cultural behaviour and the understanding of cultural behaviour and it comes down to staff training and staff being aware of culture. So one example, some some um, children in, in, in one culture are taught at home that to, if they're in trouble or something, they mustn't make eye contact. Mm. In a school, if a student doesn't make eye contact with yes. a member of staff, they will get you know, mm. torn to pieces because they want eye contact. But that's an understanding of a culture and knowing that you've got to, you've got to respect that and see that. Um, interestingly, um, last term at our SLT meeting, an English teacher came in and presented to us um, because she wanted to identify that um, at GCSE and A-level English, um, all the pieces of work that are studied are pretty much British white um, authors. Mm. And that was a big problem. That also is a problem in everyone's understanding of cultural behavior because you are not having a broad enough perspective on everything that's going on. And as a school, we have taken this on board huge. Last um, t year, we did a whole diversity month within our school to celebrate diversity, to get people to understand culture more. We've got an exclusions and inclusions officer that's come in from the borough who's working with students. We've set up um, a panel of students who are now advising staff on the things that we need to look out for and that we need to think about. All of that is really, really key. It's us as staff accepting that we need to learn more about cultures so that when we respond, we respond in the correct way. And I think that is one key problem and it's that unconscious you know, bias that, that's there that is a big problem. Yeah, just one more question, Chair, and then I'll mm -hmm. um, hand it back. So with the unconscious bias point, um, obviously in terms of school processes, 
Um, the school governors play a role in terms of the actual process of the final exclusion generally. Okay. So, um, is the lack of diversity among quite a lot of school governing bodies an issue? And are school governors asking the right questions, or do they also have a? I think are it, they asking the right questions? I think it depends on the school and the governing mm. body. I think if you went into every school you will see a complete range from a governing body that is very diverse, you know, not just in ethnicity or whatever, but also in work, ethic, careers, past, all of that, who are very fully engaged in the school, want to be involved, want to learn, want to challenge, and will do all of that to another school where you have a set of governors who are there and don't really say anything. I think it is so varied. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Let's um, go to I'll, I'll just to quickly say also I wonder if there, there should just be an independent panel that's away from the school because actually mm -hmm. our government is in a way in a conflict of interest you know you've got a good relationship with your head and are you always the best person to, to make those decisions well so I think sometimes governors are in a, a difficult situation as well but if you can be um, unbiased or you can be um, you know yeah. step back from it what training is there for governors around this as well it's you know i, I think the key is education uh, you know change yeah teacher training needs to be looked at and also training for governors as well okay let's go now to education attainment and and other outcomes and can i ask my, my colleague david to uh, pose the first two yeah, questions thank, thank you thank you um, yeah, good afternoon. So I'd just like to ask you about how um, uh, alternative provision uh, can affect or support people, uh, children and young people, in getting employment afterwards, which is a very important thing. And what I, from the figures I have, um, it seems that the, the number of uh, pupils in the alternative provision who get uh, five good GCSEs is very, very low, just 1%, which is extremely low. And of course, they need good GCSEs you know, to get um, to go on to learn the skills and to get employment. Um, how can alternative provision provide young people with the skills they need to gain employment or to go to college, as well as soft skills they might need uh, in adult Chemist, life? Just before you give an explanation of why that is and what or what you what, what AP will do, could I just put yeah. a, posit a thought as well around that? data to put it in mm. some sort of context so i think if we bear in mind that for, for all adolescents the process of, of of growing up and being an adolescent is quite a challenging time in terms of separation developing new identity identity with peers and also the demands of school and if you layer onto that the particular challenges that that young people who find themselves out of mainstream schools have had where we start to bring together that complexity of additional learning needs and combined with mental health needs combined with traumatic childhoods and um, that that's the context that we're looking at their their outcomes mm -hmm. in and what we're not able to do so when we look i'm so, i'm kind of giving this a context of because it's quite easy to, to potentially look at alternative provision and say look at the outcomes that are coming from those institutions what we can't do is make any comparative sort of judgment about young people with almost identical experiences mm. who remained in a mainstream school because lots of those experiences are untraceable we don't we're not able to for instance do the data on on young people who had managed moves and child protection plans but who stayed in a mainstream school and see how many GCSEs are outcomes that they got. So when we think about that that one percent five eight seeds, which is which is striking and it you know and it tells a dreadful picture for an awful lot of young people and, and the outcomes that they've got, it's not necessarily a picture that's that's saying that alternative provision itself is is failing then. Not not yeah. at all. And, which is not, and, and not I know that's not necessarily not, what you were saying. Not saying, saying that because yeah. obviously children there have got very complex needs yeah. and mm. and uh, you know may struggle with the sort of traditional qualifications or so on because of the complex problems yes. they have. But I think it speaks partly to, to what what yeah. is it that we want mm. to judge alternative mm. provisions by no, when we I'm decide just, how good they are. Thank you. Yeah. I'll move on to Seamus yeah. from the, the say, Academy Trust. Thing. I was really no. just thinking, you know, Sorry, this Sorry. is, you know, the statistic. I mean, yeah. Yeah. just 
just the statistic, but I was asking, yeah. you know, what I wanted to find out is how we can help, you know, and what you do, what you do do uh, to try and get uh, young people into, you know, learning skills and, uh, and into careers. The statistic, the statistic is very important, and it's, it's 1.1 last year, it was 1.2 the year point before. It's always been around between 1 and 1.5 learners in alternative provision. Mm. That's um, regulated alternative provision, achieve five or more good GCSEs. That's A to C grade or 9 to 4 grade GCSEs. Mm. Now, that figure is always the one that's used by people who wish to, I think, you know, not necessarily, and I'm not saying you're one of these, but necessarily recognise the great things that happen in alternative mm -hmm. provision, because for alternative provision to have a higher proportion of outstanding judgment schools means they must be doing something right than mainstream. Um, and that's because when Ofsted come to alternative provision, they look at lots of other measures and metrics. So they're looking at destination, so mm -hmm. the number of learners that go on to employment, further study, mm -hmm. uh, or the world of work. They're looking at progress from, point, from starting point. So notwithstanding the fact that these learners have experienced many adverse childhood experiences um, and have got many other complex needs around them, we have a very clear view around their starting point and we can demonstrate outstanding progress in terms of their progression in learning. Now, within TBAP schools, we talk very much about an entitlement to five GCSE. So if any learner comes into us at year nine, year 10 or 11, um, and they're not going to be going back to mainstream, we will, we will ensure that they have an entitlement to get five GCSEs or to sit five GCSEs. Now, some of those learners may not be capable of that, and some of them um, may not achieve that. But that's something that we keep hold of, because we recognize that achieving GCSEs um, of any grade, actually, uh, are significant um, passports to further destinations going on from year 11. So when we look at our data and we look at it nationally, you get much better statistics. So you can talk about percentage accreditation. We've achieved year on year 98% of our learners. And you know, last year that was 111 year, 111, 114 year 11 learners achieved nationally recognized accreditation. That may not be five or more GCSEs, but it will be at least one GCSE. Um, so those kinds of statistics are much better for us to report than the one that's used to judge all mainstream schools, five mm. or more good GCSEs. Mm. Where we recognise that learners are capable of achieving academic success, it's important that post-16 they can then go on and do achieve academic pathways, because traditionally, because they, they may not have achieved five or more GCSEs, they will go on to an FE college and do a level two course, which is basically going to be a repetition of a lot of the work they've done before, mm. or they will be steered towards a vocational route. We recognise that and have opened uh, what we call the 16 to 19 Academic Free School, which delivers the International Baccalaureate to exactly that group of alternative provision learners. So mm. ones that we know are capable of getting five or more A to C's, but may not have achieved it at age um, mm. 16. Our first cohort, and there's a small number, seven of them graduated this year and have all got university places. So we've got seven learners who are going to universities mm, um, from London who would not have even thought about university on the trajectory that they were on before. So one of the things that we could do as a system and is, is look at how we can make available good academic routes for learners yeah. that are capable of achieving that mm -hmm. within this sector. So they're not limited by the admissions criteria that you have in place at colleges. And to be honest with you, they are able to stay within an alternative vision setting that can nurture and provide what's needed rather than a big college where they're going to fall out straight away, which they usually do by January. Going on to the bigger cohort, we're, talk we're looking very much now about vocational subjects. And we, again, we've had a significant number of learners doing vocational subjects. I'm very keen that we, in alternative vision, work with our local employers to get to, to ask to, to get learners b um, coming out with the work skills that are needed for the employment in that area. Um, and we're talking now about a curriculum which we want to deliver in 2020 that is putting that at the heart of it. Actually, poss possibly instead of five mm. or more GCSEs. So the entitlement is that you are going. To, you know, my dream is at 14 you might be able to say, well, I've got a route which is going to bring me into guaranteed employment at age 18, age 19, age 20, with this, in, with this local employer who, who is situated near to me. And I would like, as a provider, to be working with those employers to get the curriculum that's going to deliver the work skills that those learners need. So, you know, looking at excluded children, it's around, as I started off with 
um, talking about the personalization of a curriculum. It's trying to find exactly what it is they need to progress post-16. If it's an academic route, making sure we can provide that. If it's a vocational work-based route, making sure that we provide that too. Um, whilst recognizing that transition is important, they need to have accreditation in order to do that. Yeah. But we must not get hung up on the five or more GC good GCSEs. Thank you. I, I, I do agree with you. I mean, the yeah. academic route is not for everybody. No. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion around at the moment saying you know, that academic is seen as something up here, but technical and vocational Absolutely. is down there. And we need yeah. parity of esteem between mm. academic mm. and technical and vocational. So, so that, I, I like your answer there. And it may be, I mean, uh, the, the idea that there's a right to have five GCSEs is the wrong thing. I mean, maybe you could say there's a right to have, you know, an, an academic route or yeah. a vocational technical route. And, yeah. and, and with then, I mean, do you think that um, there's a need for more supported internships or yeah. apprenticeships, perhaps, Absolutely. you know, yeah. to, in, in alternative? I provision? think it's really important. And that's the apprenticeships and an apprenticeship route would be the one that I would see being able to deliver that. Now, we are... We are actually lucky with an alternative provision because we can do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Mainstream schools could do this kind of stuff a few yeah. years ago, but have increasingly been focused on achieving five or more good GCSEs. Yeah. And I think that's partly, partly explains why there's been such an increase in exclusion, because some of our head teachers, if, and I, I'll say it, I think some head teachers, if they know a learner is capable of getting five or more GCSEs, they will do everything to keep that yeah. child in school. We provide them an alternative provision within school but away from possibly the rest of the school, the mainstream school, until we can get them to a point where they're ready to go back into the classroom of 30, 32. That's, that's an option because when you do a fixed term exclusion, you have that risk of they are leaving the school, they're out of your hands and they're in their parents' hands and parental responsibility and parental engagement will vary massively from a parent who will be in that house with their daughter or son from morning till evening, they're not going anywhere, they're doing the work that's been set to other parents that leave them and tell them to get on with it. So by having an alternative in-house provision, that will hopefully avoid that for many. But again, that will come down to resources for individual school on whether they can, where they can actually provide that, because if you're going to have an alternative provision in your school, you're going to have to have the staff and the resources and the space to be able to do that. Well, that leads into the next question, really. The Mayor's Young London Fund, which has just been launched, um, obviously is providing um, money for projects. So what projects should the GLA be looking at um, that can make a difference to divert young people away from criminal behaviour or being drawn into it? What, what, if you had a, a wish list, what would the top three things be that a project, for example? Anybody? Um, I, I, so, if I, so just to give a bit of context as well, so before I did the job that I'm doing now, I was the head of inclusion for 10 years of Tower Hamlet's Pupil Referral Unit, and until September, I was the deputy head of inclusion for a big mainstream school in Greenwich. So I have seen an awful lot of kids who have been excluded and also been on the other end of being responsible for excluding and also trying not to exclude young people. I think I would, I don't, I, I, there is, when, when you're externally excluding students, um, there is always a risk that they're not at home and they're, they're, they're straying towards criminal activity. In my experience, um, young people who are being drawn into criminal activity, it's a, it's a complex correlation of the, the lots of things that are going on in their life rather than a sort of direct cause that because they're being externally excluded, they're going, um, they're being drawn into criminal activity. Um, and with that in mind, I mean, I think that what has certainly been lost from lots of schools and lots of local authorities are constructive activities that happen after school that are easy for young people to access that will keep them away from being um, on the streets initially, quite sociably with their friends, but because they're on the streets sociably with their friends, um, and their adolescence and being your, your identity is in who you identify with is quite important. It's very easy to be drawn into activities that are a little bit antisocial and from that into for some to become drawn into much more antisocial and criminal activities because there isn't anywhere 
is that is actually ha there isn't anything happening on site at your school straight after school that you can get involved in and there isn't something happening immediately in your community that you can go and get involved in and the requirement for lots of young people is that they have engaged parents who a engage their children enough to get them home straight away after school and then are able to actually take them and engage them in things that happen later on you know five o'clock six o'clock or whatever youth clubs scouts whatever though you know parents who have that relationship and that capacity have a great deal of, of strength for keeping their children safe and out of criminal activity but there's a whole host of other young people for whom that just isn't either financially or logistically possible and that you know any sort of projects that are being funded in and around schools that actually draw young people in are going to be keeping them much safer after school and therefore um, much less likely to be drawn into criminal activity. What sort of age would you sort of aim that at, bearing in mind that as they get older, what we hear, especially through the, um, the, crime, the, the crime board, that actually the, the kids that are likely to be in trouble don't want to get involved in things like that, and the, like after school activities or whatever. And the kids that um, you're not going to have any issues with crime-wise are very happy to go to that, even if they haven't got parental supervision or, or encouragement. Um. So, yeah, so nice. really, it's thinking out of the box, really, isn't it? So, yeah. for me, if I, if you were to give that money to me, what would I, you do with it? I would, I would be able to set up a team of people who can um, have really knowledge, experience, and can teach about character education. And I would get them to provide free education to schools, to go into schools and actually provide students and staff with knowledge, understanding of character education and how to build that um, so that then that can be put in across to all the students in that school. Um, because the problem is we do character education. We've brought lots of companies in, lots of different things to do that. We are lucky to have some money to be able to do that. But there's lots of schools that don't. So actually a free resource of people who can go into schools and give teachers and students education on character and how to build character in education um, to be able to then implement that into their school even more. Well, that's a good example yeah. of where the money could be put. Yeah, thank you. Well, well, the challenge is getting those, is, is, as you say, get, is tackling the children that are already on the road to, to crime because they, they, may, they may not engage with those kinds of positive activities if they're provided through the mainstream school, um, which is where I think things like the, um, what did you call your centre, resort, Hack the Hackney centres, early intervention centres, resource, what were your early intervention centres called? Are oh, you talking about our youth hubs? No. Nope. Oh, the re-engagement That's unit. the one, yeah, so the re-engagement units and managed intervention centres, so with Hackney and then the four London boroughs that we work with all run these centres, and these centres are, are getting children that are on the road to crime or, mm. or at risk of exclusion and they are the group mm. that actually the biggest difference can be made with um, because if we can get positive activities into that group then perhaps we, they will not go down the, the road that, that they've already started on. We've, we have done some of that kind of work at the Westminster Centre where um, sort of some, some projects have gone in and done work around knife crime etc etc but it may be that if there is funding available other London boroughs could do that kind of work and it works well if schools work it come together and cause both, you know the Westminster Centre is subscribed to by all of the secondary school most of the secondary schools in Westminster the one in Hammersmith is subscribed to by most of the ha schools in Hammersmith so you start to get that cohort of children together who probably do know each other out of school um, and who are at risk of gang activity are at risk of moving into crime being um, picked up at a much earlier stage than if they've gone down that road and gone in, into the in terms of provision or into the youth justice system. So that could be quite a good mechanism of getting that cohort rather than um, whole school approaches in mainstream, which may well tackle some of them, but you, quite often these children won't be in the mainstream class by that stage. They'll be in the isolation unit or they'll be on the road to fixed term exclusion, etc., yeah. etc. Et Very often they don't want to be part and of they the won't mainstream. Want to be, yeah, they won't want to be it. Whereas, you know, we... we all sorts of positive activities take place in alternative provision all the time. It's the best work that ever takes place. Residentials, going off camping, you know, boxing, rugby, all of these things work really well. But you've got to 
get the children in a space where they feel safe enough to do that. Um, and the managed intervention centres and an early intervention could be quite a good space to do it. Okay, I'm mindful of the time. I just wanted to quickly say, when you answer that question, it's like answering a, Chris, a child, what do you want for Christmas? Mm. And actually, you picked up on the points. So I would have um, inclusion units within school. So one of our secondary school has an inclusion unit. So in, in a way to combat um, excluding children, they are um, still educated and have the same education of the school day, mm. but just in a different part of the school, in smaller classes, with specialised staff. And actually, we're beginning to see that making a difference. So that's one of the things that I would say, that actually we change the education system, that it's held within the school. I would say um, outreach to get better in-reach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can give some money to schools, yes, but what about the children that don't engage in school? And actually when young people are getting into those increasingly challenging situations and risk-taking, it isn't happening within the school. And it's about what you were saying in getting children to be able to, to regulate and be able to self-identify and moderate that behaviour. So you need better outreach. And the last thing I would say was cultural competency training. You know, better training for staff, better education and empowerment for staff to, to do the job that they want to do and do it very well. I think it's really interesting that, and you know, I'm a teacher, unfortunately, I've never had to exclude a child, but it's really interesting that we're saying to improve your behavior, your education life chances, we're gonna deprive you of your education for a period of time. <laughs> Yes, but surely... There's something uncomfortable with yeah, that, but, so but what then, can we do differently? But then you've got a duty of care to all the other children within the class. You do have... We a, must you, bear that in mind. Yes, I, but, I, but, but, but my challenge back and my pushback to you on that would be saying, I'm not saying... I, said, I think I said quite early on, there are times when it isn't safe or right for a child to stay in the school. But actually, when we move that child, we need to think about the education that we're providing. And that's what I'm saying. We need to think about that differently for that child. Um, Not that they stay in their environment, but actually that the level of education and input that they get and their social and emotional well-being isn't put at risk because they can't manage in that environment. Yeah, and and I think we need to do that differently. I think if you actually come down to really finding out all the reasons why students are excluded, there yeah. are so many in there that you will see was that really necessary for a student to be excluded for that reason? Because okay. it, it, you'll, you'll see, yeah. yeah. It'd be the third right, time they've touched someone in a line, so they've been, there's a fixed... Uh, yeah, I, a fixed I think, I think we've got that message from other, and, that, and, I, and we understand that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you um, uh, Tony, um, well, pre well, prevention, well, uh, issues that you haven't heard or covered. Well, uh, there, there's just one thing. I think what you've described... Um, Serena, is internal exile, isn't it? They're not being excluded, they're being internally exiled. And I was struck by the fact that you said that you're really only doing that because you're now in um, a much larger trust, uh, whereas hither we are able to provide this sort of internal Siberia. Um, but before, your school was too small, is that right? Um, no, not so much. I mean... For us as a school, our exclusion rates... Because you were a selective school. We're a selective school. Our exclusion rates are very, right. very okay. low. I take that. Um, for us, we are sponsoring a, a, a mainstream school um, where they are very different to us. Yes. And so we're sponsoring them to support them and to be able to help and change what's going on there. And one of the things that we're looking at is their rates of exclusion. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking yes. at that in-house alternative. But, the point, but I think I, I thought that the point you were making was that because you've gone in with this other school, you now have the resources to be able to provide a unit inside the school. Um, no, they already have. Oh, the, a, they already talking. have a unit of of, of some okay, kind. Right. Of some kind. Okay, all yeah. right. Okay. Well, um, I, I, I take that point. Yeah. It is. It is sometimes said that a child who has been excluded, in effect is, uh, to extend my metaphor about exile, is permanently exiled because nobody wants them uh, in, in, in another school. Is that um, a misreading of the situation? You know, kind of give a dog a bad name? There, is, there are cases where permanently excluded children will go into main, back into mainstream school, absolutely. So it, where there are good in-year fair access panels operating in local authorities, they will look at the hard-placed pupils who will often be yes. permanently excluded or have had that in their, in their record, and they will be taken on by mainstream schools. So that happens. Likewise, alternative provision welcomes excluded children with open arms, so they absolutely are wanted by us. Really. Um, 
in your trust, where you presumably have all kinds of economies of scale, do you provide the kind of unit which we've just heard about? So we have an approach, because, because we are dealing with children who've been excluded, the, the concept of fixed term exclusions doesn't sit comfortably with us at all, because these are children who are very vulnerable and will be putting back into the street or into homes where there will absolutely will not be any parental supervision. So we very early on developed that's what we call Tate, which is the alternative to exclusion, um, which is very similar to the, the setup that you've, you've talked about, where a child will go for one day, maybe two days, probably no, very rarely more than two days, um, to be with a learning support professional, have some work to do in terms of their learning, but more importantly, look at what went wrong. And we talk about the ABCs of what's gone, what happened before the incident, during and after. So look at what's gone on within alternative provision to cause them to have that fixed term exclusion and then move forward from it. So um, that's something we think we find is very successful um, and, and did reduce levels of fixed term exclusions pretty significantly in quite a lot of the, school, the alternative provision schools that we work with. Can I just pick up on that as well and say that um, there was an, something in the press recently that was quite negative about internal inclusion. It was kind of using that sort of language of, uh, of isolation and, um, and I'm sure there are, a good, you know, there are examples where sitting in a room staring at a wall for a whole day with almost nothing to do is, is what that looks like. But, in, but, in it, but at its best, internal exclusion offers lots of opportunity for restorative meetings, for other professionals um, within a school to do extra assessments of needs, for students to, um, to start to reconsider things about a particular incident and work their way through how they might address it in a different way next time. So there's lots and lots of things that can happen during an internal exclusion if schools have the capacity to set that up and resource it in a way that goes beyond just sitting in a room. And By capacity, do you mean size, i.e. there are so many children in the school that the school budget, if you like, is, is going to be able to incorporate that. I can well, I can well imagine a school probably of less than a thousand pupils uh, to have a, instead of the children looking at the blank walls and having the fulfilling thing that you're suggesting, that will be such a burden, a drain on the school's resources, they couldn't provide it unless mm. the school was very large. Is there I, well, a I, I was at, my, The school I was at before was a 2,000 plus school and, um, and, and that, that, that wasn't, it wasn't a physical space mm. issue that, that um, it was more, um, in, you know, in the end it was finances as to how much could you give them beyond the sitting in the room is how many additional people can you have within your kind of inclusion isolation space to actually do work one-to-one -one with someone during the course of a day. I don't think it matters the size of the school to be able to provide that. Any school should be able to provide that and that's you know what you said is the best when in an internal in-house alternative um, you want it to be at the best with what you're providing. I think internal isolation where they're standing at wall that's not what any school should have or would mm -hmm. want because you're not going to having an in-house alternative where they are still getting you know their core subject education mm -hmm. but they're also being able to discuss what went wrong what happened how can we move forward maybe having some testing in there that's needed for them that is the key but any school should be able to provide that but when funding comes in there could well, be schools that might struggle with that yeah that's it I, I I guess we've all served as school governors. I, I mean, I, 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 I've, lived, I, I've lived, through, lived through this. Yes, we'd like to keep the children in the school, um, but at the end of the day, the school doesn't have the resources yeah. to provide all of that. And if there was um, a large school nearby which had such a unit, we'd send the ch children back. And really, the origin of my question, which, which I put to you, is there might then be a reluctance for the school um, to have the child back from the unit because the child is a known disruptor. Within the context or am I ha taking a very jaundiced view? No, no. So within the context of the managed intervention centres, um, we have, there is, they, I think like it's, it's around about 98% have, have gone back into mainstream and not yes. come back to the managed intervention centre. And as with, with over 400 uh, act, L London learners accessing that resource across the four boroughs over the last year, so there's a high number of learners going into those centres and then going back into school if the work's done well. And that's around, because we're, you know, that centre's serving sort of five, nine, nine schools there within Hammersmith and Fulham, but it's really important that, that the, the schools have the trust 
with the, the outcomes. Because where it's done badly, yes, they go into a centre and sit and look at a wall. Where it's done well, you know, they'll be going back into schools with evidence that the learning has taken place and also that the behaviour has been, or well, the issues around the behaviour have been looked at and tackled and identified. So, you know, where that sort of um, setup can work that schools currently have, because it's one, you can, you know, in the smallest setup, you would have one support worker um, working with a, you know, three or four children at any one time. Um, so that you know, that's that's how that would be organised within a school organisation. But it can absolutely reduce fixed term exclusion rates significantly. Um, and where you've got schools geographically close to one another, they can start to share that kind of resource as well. Those are sorts of solutions that people have come up with. I think schools have to also. I think what you were saying, you know, they go off um, for the alternative provision and come back. The schools don't want them. I think schools they have to have that open mind and they have to be willing to um, accept and move forward and put things behind, but also to be able to provide further support. A student coming back, it doesn't end there. No. You've, you've got to make sure that you provide further support mm. and ongoing support from that point <laughs> onwards. Often, you know, this happens, students get a, a fixed term exclusion, they go to an alternative provision for a little while, and then they come back and there's no support afterwards. I think what's really important is that schools have the open mind of, moving forward and what provision what support can we now give yeah. to, to to be able to make this successful and okay, schools well, under Jen, that sounds an optimistic pressure. note to finish on you know you, there was an article in the news it was a couple of months back where a primary school i think had written to parents saying we want to take children on a trip can you pay for it i mean these are the extreme pressures that schools are under and actually mm -hmm. it then goes back to a time that actually if your parents can afford to pay you get to go on that school trip and if it's a, a deprived area those children don't go so not that i'm excusing this by far but actually it's it really just brings into the picture how school funding is really affecting schools and how that then cascades down to some of the most vulnerable children well thank you so much we thank you from, from all of you, um, that we, we will do f f f follow up work from what we've heard today. So, for instance, we know that the mayor's got funding uh, lines, um, and we know that the, the mayor will be taking on board the FE budgets in the future. So, what we will be doing is pulling together many of the thoughts and ideas that you've raised in terms of how then we can um, write to the mayor and say, having heard this from a, a group of experts, are your officers looking to be including um, these um, you know, uh, funding proposals that they receive um, in a way of additional support? This, this will not be new because um, in the last administration, um, funding was provided to schools um, and uh, myself and others went out and visited um, the initiatives, which were absolutely amazing. And I think it's what you said, Serena and Antoinette. It was the additionality mm. of that um, 10, 20, 50,000. Mm. Sadly, what they reported back was if they could only have it for two years, the frustration for the rest of the school, uh, because they, they, the rest of the school could see changes happening and then they weren't able to then uh, follow on. So we will be exploring many of the mm. issues that you've raised with the mayor, with the deputy mayor for education mm. and, uh, and young people mm. um, and, um, and, and exploring that. And uh, uh, I, with collaboration with uh, members of this panel, mm. will then see how we can uh, make um, this discussion that we've had this afternoon, which is so rich, how we can make that available um, because there is a need for people to have a better understanding of this very complex area. Mm. So thank you so much. And um, Samira and I will be going through the minutes and the notes and everything. And I do hope that we can contact you if uh, we come across something that we don't understand. If I may just say, Chair, as well, I would encourage you also not just to think about the money to come into the system, because it is, because I... I We'll always say more money, but also different ways of working. Because one of the things that we've got is a group of head teachers mm -hmm. in Hackney that are meeting about exclusions and what they can do about that. So it isn't just about additionality and mm -hmm. money, which mm -hmm. 
yes, we want and need, but actually different ways of working because you want to make whatever input or programme, you start to make it sustainable and you do that by changing practice, ideology, ways Sharing of working, pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. Could I just very, very briefly, because I, I, I kind of postponed this when we were going through, just to say that the Difference Le Inclusion Leaders Programme, when, it when it's running, will take uh, mainstream teachers out of um, mainstream schools and place them in pupil referral units for two years and train them before they go back to mainstream schools. And the, 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 the three things in particular that that will do, which I think are really important in terms of shape the systems in their schools, um, knowledge to properly engage with external services and agencies and actually have developed the skills that they need to do that to make mm. those systems work for themselves and also start to embed with some of the things we've talked about here about school culture which recognises that behaviours that are quite challenging are also telling us things about needs that are not being met or experiences that a young person is currently having or may have had in their past that, that we could do something about if we recognise those issues um, rather than just see it as challenging behaviour that needs mm. to be sanctioned. So that, that, that's the aim of that difference programme. Thank you so much. And that so links in with, I know, a funded programme enabling and supporting head teachers. But I don't know if uh, the inclusion leaders are new to that. But again, it's something that we can explore uh, yeah. in our follow-up work. So thank you once again. Um, members, uh, thank you for your contribution here today. Um, and uh, let's go to um, the end of the meeting. Can I ask the panel to note um, the report um, and the subsequent discussion that we've had here today and agree to delegate authority to me in discussion with group leaders um, to agree um, an output from this meeting and any follow-ups that we need to do. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, can we just... Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Just a minute, quickly. Okay. Um, education work plan. Can the panel please agree the work programme? Yes. And the date of the next meeting is scheduled for 8th November uh, 2018 at 2.30 in the Chamber. Um, I haven't been notified of any other business um, and there's nothing that's been considered urgent. Thank you very much. Okay, end of meeting. GLA Chamber.